We are recording. We are live. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'd like to start this morning with a little, a little known fact. And it's quite apt because it's from Paddock Wood, which, as I'm sure everybody knows, is just outside where the head office of the IAB is. And on the 28th of January, 1896, a Walter Arnold drove his horseless carriage through the village of Paddock Wood. At more than four times the speed limit, a reckless eight miles an hour, <laughs> he was chased down by a police officer on a bicycle <laughs> who charged him with breaking the law on four counts, using a locomotive without a horse on a public road, allowing said locomotive to be operated by fewer than three persons, Travelling at a greater rate than two miles per hour and failing to clearly display his name and address on the said locomotive. He was brought before local magistrates on the 30th of January and found guilty on all four counts. He was fined £4, seven shillings, which in today's money is approximately £260. And only 10 shillings of that was actually for the speeding. Can you imagine speeding at eight miles an hour? <laughs> and being caught by a police officer on his bicycle. <laughs> yeah, a little, little known fact for you. I love Caroline's facts. And, it's going to be a feature. <laughs> yeah. And just as a, a reminder, it's not tax deductible fines for speeding. <laughs> <laughs> so please don't let any clients claim. It's not. <laughs> right. Moving on, Sarah, a context last week. Yeah, oh yeah, a context was absolutely brilliant. So Sam, Tom, myself, um, Andrew, we were all there. Unfortunately, Janet wasn't because Janet was um, on a business trip in India, but she's back now. Um, really, really uh, incredible vibe, really, really busy, really busy. I can believe at 10 o'clock when they opened the, the doors on the first day, there was this roar of people coming in. I think everyone thought they were let loose after covid and um, really good vibe really lovely to see so many of you here or come and visit us so we saw lots of our members ambassadors so um yeah thank you for coming and saying hello and um i'd love to hear how the show went so if you want to put anything in the chat that would be really good to see what anything positive you had out of the show so um yeah good day sam did you want to add anything it's just uh yeah, other than it was nice to meet a lot of you in person i thought that was it was really good it's usually on email or just see people's faces so for me it was great to start meeting some people um, um, and is peter here is peter on the call i haven't seen him uh, it was really lovely i think um peter is one of our oldest members i think he was one of the original members um so it was really lovely for him to come up seeing it's a 50th anniversary of the ib next year so um that's quite a statement wow. to be making two days as well peter didn't they yeah he did he did. So, um, yeah, no, re really positive couple of days. Really good to see you all. Uh, so. Everybody in the chat seemed to enjoy it. Mm. Morning, morning. Nice to meet you at Account X from Katie, Rachel. Wish they would do something new up in Scotland. I would love it. Oh, Rachel, I'm in Carlisle, so we could have a we could have like a far northern <laughs> splinter group, maybe. I'm happy to travel to the lakes. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's like a lake district theme. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah no, Rich, enough. you. So, I know you're busy. Zero stand had cocktail. I'm back to you. <laughs> right, so moving on, um, I'd like to welcome Andrew Rumsey from Portland Leonard Curtis who actually is joining us this morning after a recommendation from a member, a Jenny Coffin, who recommended he came along to talk to us. So if anybody has anybody that they think would be beneficial on a coffee morning, feel free to um, contact the IAB and just put their name forward. That would be great. Andrew is going to do a general overview of insolvency causes and avoiding the pitfalls. Where are you, Andrew? There. There he is. I think I've unmuted you, Andrew. Yep, looks good. Yeah. Sorry, I could have spoken, couldn't I? That would have been more helpful. You could, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to share your screen this morning? 
I do. I'm, I'm very nervous about this because I, <laughs> I work most of the time on a sort of cloud-based thing and I, I'm not on that. So I'm, I'm hoping that I can still share, but um, we will, yeah, we'll see, see what happens. Right. Do you want to try it? See if it oh, here we go. I've got lots of desktops that are showing the right picture, so it's, it's looking promising. Um, let's try this. Try this one. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Here we are. Good start. Oh, get to the right screen so I know what I'm doing. Okay. There we go, yeah. So my name is Andrew Rumsey. As, a, as it says on the screen, I work for a company called Portland Leonard Curtis. Uh, and that is the um, coming together of my firm, Portland, who, who I've worked with for a couple of years, uh, have merged with a larger national firm called Leonard Curtis. So we, we've represented right across the UK, or at least a significant part of it, certainly through the whole of England and up into Scotland and, and into Wales. Um, I work I live in Bournemouth. And we have a we have an office local to me, and um, we also have an office in Hampshire. So that's my main stomping grounds. But we get out into the counties surrounding us on a regular basis, and and obviously as a as a wider firm, I have colleagues all around the country. So moving on onto the today's topic, um, everyone I speak to over the last two years has gone, oh gosh, you must have been busy, and and the reality has not not been the case. Um, the government support did did exactly what it was intended. The finance was put there for companies to take advantage of the loans and so forth and the support systems that took away the risk of, of people being wound up in the courts and so on so actually we had a relatively quiet period over the last couple of years what we are now seeing um, starting late last year and, and with more obvious certainty in february march this year is it sort of swing back to what were normal levels and are now in excess of the levels that we were seeing prior to the pandemic and all the things that you'll know about that I've listed down there, bounce back loans needing to be repaid. HMRC and landlords starting to be a bit more determined to get their money back. are all having their issues. And of course, just, just as if we hadn't had enough, the Ukraine conflict and so forth has, has started destabilizing supply lines and, and things like this, which is having its impact on, on inflation and cost of living. So whereas everyone has been living through a tumultuous time for the last two years in insolvency terms, we're just starting to see that come to the fore. And obviously it's anyone's guess how that will pan out over the next year or so, but I think certainly we're going to be relatively busy for the short term. So I thought I'd just very briefly touch on some of the ways of, of mitigating risk for companies. And I'm, I'm probably talking to the converted here, but um, it's really just a few things that I, I cover when I do do presentations. Um, the first is is a reliance on a few customers or, or a key supplier um, in this in this world that we're currently living in. We never know who might be the next person that, that fails. And, and what we want to avoid is, is people relying on a key customer. Um, I remember dealing with a, a, a logistics firm who dealt with the Rover Group and that resulted, that was about 80% of their turnover. They, they struggled afterwards, but managed to survive it. Um, and obviously the same with suppliers. If you only got one supplier that provides you with something key to your business, the last thing you need is for that supplier to suddenly fail and you not to be able to get that. So it's always good to try and diversify as much as possible. Um, spotting changes in payment patterns or communication when you're dealing with your customers. Are they, are they paying on time? Are they suddenly asking for deferred terms? Um, you know, Then you need to make the decision how you treat that person going forwards, um, making sure that you don't open yourself up to risk. And the issue of the funding gap between payments going out of your company and, and the money coming in. Yeah, everyone's going to have a bit of a funding gap in all likelihood, but it's trying to reduce that down to make it manageable for you so, so that you're not paying out straight away and then waiting 90 days to get paid. And something we see all the time in insolvency is, is that is the company that decides to go big often happens in construction where there's a lot of male ego involved. They go for the big trading, big, that big job that they've always wanted to do and the costs get out of control and, and, and suddenly they've got issues with payment and, and that can be the end of their company. So if, if companies are going to grow, it's about making sure they've got systems in place, the very people in place, the financial information in place. Do they know what their break even is? Do they even know what that term means? Um, have they got the cash flow forecast to know that they can work their way forwards? And, uh, you know, pat on the back for, for yourselves, accountants and bookkeepers and the like is making sure they've got a safe pair of hands working with them to provide the financial information and, and keep them on top of that so that they're not surprised by their, by their accounts being given to them sort of a year after 
that year has ended to find out that it's actually insolvent. And one of the things that is a regular issue when we're speaking to directors of companies facing financial difficulties is the fact that there's often that moment where they realize that they owe the company money and, and where that comes out of is, is the way in which they get paid. Um, you know, every, every accountant understandably reckon, recommends, you know, a mixture of salary and dividends and that, that absolutely works for a company that's trading profitably. The issue which most directors are blind to and don't hear mentioned in the conversation that invariably had is if you're not trading profitably, you can't necessarily draw a dividend. And that's the bit that always uh, causes a difficult conversation as a company is uh, facing an insolvency process and the director on top of that is being told, well, actually, you owe £50,000 or whatever the number may be. So uh, we can never stress enough <laughs> the, the need to make, make people aware of that. And, and that's probably the issue that we see most day, day to day when we're dealing with companies that are, that are going into an insolvency process. So having a quick look at the options, and this is a bit of a breakneck speed tour because it's not too long a, um, a time I've got to speak to you. So I'm not going to go through the processes themselves, more the purpose of the processes and, and how we try and utilise those to help people. So firstly, I'm going to look at the informal negotiation. That's always you know, the ideal opportunity. If something can be dealt with informally and, and the company can be put back on the straight and narrow without the need to enter a process, A, it's going to be a lot cheaper. It doesn't advertise the issues that the company is perhaps facing as much to the, to the wider public. And um, yeah, hopefully it's the most straightforward way of dealing with it. And typically, the most obvious uh, person that we find ourselves speaking to or companies need to speak to is HMRC. You know, mo most uh, creditors are often quite demanding in making sure they get their money. HMRC sometimes forget that they need to chase their debts. So if a company needs to speak to HMRC about time to pay or something similar, a good compliance record, making sure that they behave themselves up until that point as much as is possible is always a good starting point not sticking your head in the sand, making sure you get into an early dialogue with HMRC. And then generally speaking, especially at the moment, um, getting a time to pay for 6, 12, 18 months is, is not too much of an issue. Um, HMRC are being relatively relaxed about that, even to the point where as long as you've arranged, say, PAYE repayments, they're not necessarily going to get too worried about the VAT debt might be outstanding. Um, so it's surprising at the moment quite how um, flexible HMRC are and that's very much in contrast to perhaps how we all perceive them and how they have been historically. I think inevitably that will come back at some point, but for the time being, uh, they're in a good place. If the debt is more serious and, and 18 months isn't going to get you through, then you know, there are still options there. And we have a specialist team within Leonard Curtis called Corporate Strategies that deal with HMRC, HMRC day in, day out. And uh, they've recently been letting us know that they have had arrangements in place for up to seven to ten years now these are very much the exception but there is that possibility of getting those longer term arrangements in place where it's a big debt and there's a viable uh, repayment uh, exercise that can be undertaken and of course this applies in general terms to all creditors it's not just hmrc where we can take this approach um so getting an informal arrangement with your creditors um, making sure that all the creditors that you need in that process agree. Obviously, if one person that's got a major debt won't agree to it, then it can stymie any attempt to do this. But as long as you can speak to your creditors, get them to agree to a payment plan. And as, 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 as you will know, not over-promising. There's no point in telling them you can pay it back in six months if it's going to take you 18. You just need to be honest up front and, and be able to stick to the plan that you've put in place. And of course, with this, again, cash flow forecasts are an important aspect of it. Um, so the first of the three processes I'm going to have a very quick run through on is company voluntary arrangements. And this is, this is perfect where a company doesn't want to, to fail, um, has, has probably come across a one-off nightmare scenario, perhaps the loss of a major um, customer, uh, but can re restructure their business. Perhaps it's where there's been a pandemic or something and you know, something has really had a major hit on your turnover but you can get back up to scale again and you can get back to normal. The company voluntary arrangement is perfect insofar as you can say, I'll pay this money back over five years, for instance. That's the sort of typical term. I'll pay it from profits I'm going to generate in that period. And I'm only going to pay you 60 pence in the pound because that, that's what we can achieve. And generally speaking, anything sort of north of 25 pence in the pound is, is, is a reliable 
likelihood of, of it being repaid if, if you haven't sort of taken the mickey too much with your, with your creditors in terms of how you've been treating them up to that point. The issues with the CVA are, are largely based around HMRC. Um, HMRC, is, as you may be aware, um, got back its preferential status about uh, 15 months ago. And most of it, the HMRC debt falls into that preferential area. So they get entitled to get paid before the average trade creditor. And they want 100 pence in the pound. That's their default. They're not, they're not willing to budge from that. So if HMRC are owed a significant amount of money, then a CBA might be dead in the water before you start. Because if, if you've only got enough money to pay that HMRC debt, other creditors aren't going to be enticed by getting little or no return once you've paid that back. So I, I love CBAs. I think they're a great tool. Unfortunately, where HMRC are a large creditor, they can they can sort of make it a non-starter, even though it's a great exercise. And I mentioned there about re-gearing leases. You may be familiar with a lot of the high street retailers using CBAs to, to negotiate improved lease terms. Um, and that's been another popular use of the CBA in recent times. So the next one is administration. Administration is is really the classic tool to be able to continue an underlying business seamlessly or almost seamlessly when one company is failing, but there's a, the, the underlying business can still be strong, but it's got debts it can't deal with. And, and you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the, with the term, the pre-pack, where a sale is agreed in advance and, and the, the new company will start running the business the day the company- goes Andrew, the sorry yeah. to interrupt. Is the slides or is it just the cover picture? Is it not going through? Sorry. No, all we're actually seeing is the um, what I'm assuming is your title page of cash flow difficulties and insolvency options. So I've got two screens up. Yeah, I've been merrily uh, working my way through my slides and uh, <laughs> you've not been seeing any of them, have you? No. That is not, no. not helpful. Um, I think we're all following along anywhere without them. Yes, let me just see whether I can. Yeah, just to make you aware. Is that now changing? Yeah, that's better. What a pain. Well, hopefully yeah. you're not missing too much. There's only some highlighted points there. But so, yeah, sorry. So on, on administrations, um, one of the key key things, um, you know, the directors are often asking us about is that they often want to continue the business. And uh, as long as there's an underlying business there, then it, it's perfectly reasonable for the, for the directors of a company that might be failing to buy it back out of administration into a new entity. Um, the obvious thing being that they do need to be the, the best offer on the table. Um, and more often than not, that's the case simply because they're the party that are most invested in it and they believe in the business and, and are willing to pay that price, assuming they can get the finances in place. So as, assuming that there's the finance there and, and you know they, they can sort of show that they can make the business work going forwards, then there's, there's no reason why directors of a company can't, can't con continue through the business, the underlying business in a new entity and take it out the other side. Um, the caveat on that is that there was a, a, a new role of the evaluator has, has recently come into the insolvency world and they, they are required to assess whether or not the sale represents a fair deal for creditors and this, this adds a bit of cost, it adds a bit of time and as a consequence it's probably limited the amount of administrations that are happening where there is a sale to a connected party which is when these people need to get involved. So, so typically we're seeing a few more people go down the liquidation route where the evaluator doesn't have any role to play, um, but the liquidation isn't quite as seamless and, and straightforward in terms of try being able to keep the business running because a liquidation requires that you give creditors notice of what's happening in advance, whereas administration can happen really without their knowing anything that's going on in the background if, if, you, if you manage to keep things under wraps. So that's, that's the administration. And then finally, uh, in terms of the insolvencies, liquidation. Um, so a liquidation, typically familiar with sort of the winding down of a company, it's ceasing to trade and then just really selling the assets and trying to regain as much value as possible for creditors to repay what they may be due. But there is still, um, it's perfectly possible and acceptable for uh, you know the assets to be sold and for the business to carry on trading. Although typically you probably see employees being made redundant and then the directors might um, you know, pick up some or all of the employees afterwards. Um, lots of complications around these issues, which I won't go into today. But um, one of the key things that is often asked about it is, can I carry on trading under the same name? And the answer is yes, but you do have to jump through certain hoops. And so if a director is looking to carry on trading, following a company going into liquidation, they do need to make sure their ducks are in a row and that they've approached the um, 
insolvency practitioner and got solicitors in place to enable the legal loopholes to be addressed and, and dealt with so that they can come out the other side and not find themselves personally liable potentially for any of the uh, future companies uh, liabilities and so on or, or indeed just get prosecuted for using the name so there are there are risks associated with it but they can be circumvented quite easily as long as a bit of planning is put in place um so that that is i feel like whistle stop doesn't do it justice uh, i could probably have spent 10 or 20 minutes talking on any one of these slides so apologies if i'm if i'm rushing through but i wanted to try and cover the basics on, on the main bits and pieces no that's um, brilliant andrew can you email somebody at the iab a copy of your slides and we'll put them yeah alison has already got those so yeah all we right can, excellent we can do that. Um, I've got a question for you as well from um, Alison Bryan. One of my clients just filed for liquidation. They owe HMRC a considerable sum, over £50,000, and they owe many creditors, including me, 4000 I received my letter from the insolvency practice. What happens after the HMRC payment? How are other creditors treated? And is there an order of how people may be paid? Yeah, so in all in all insolvency processes, there's prescribed order of payment that's set out in the Insolvency Act. And broadly speaking, um, the, the bank will get its security on any assets like a property or, or book debts and that they get monies first. Then it goes to H. Um, employees get a certain amount first after that for any arrears of wages and holiday. Then, the, then HMRC for most of its debts in a preferential. And then broadly speaking, after that, um, you've got the bank in relation to anything under its floating charge and appreciate you may not understand what the floating charge is but any other recoveries for the bank and then finally uh, unfortunately everyone else down at the bottom so that will be the trade suppliers and some of the residual hmrc debt and employees in relation to redundancy pay and so on but albeit employees have protection and get money from the redundancy payment service as a separate exercise hope that helps alison um, Elaine asks do you have a full webinar on this subject at any point? Um, haven't got anything in place at the moment. We do what we do have on um, on YouTube, and I can direct you towards it. Is we do have a series of videos that um, myself and colleagues have done on on various different topics, uh, covering covering some of these aspects. So they they might be of use. Um, I think there's ten or fifteen videos on there. Um, but uh, um, yeah, if, if there's anything else you wanted to know, happy to field any sort of general questions or anything more specific. Okay. Um, you? Can you send yeah. those links into the IAB, Andrew, and then we can put them on the website for the, for members? So that yeah, they can have a look. So. Yeah. Great. Um, I, I'm definitely seeing uh, through our practices a lot more businesses in distress now as well. I think you're right. It's it's post COVID. This is where the problem's going to be. So um, yeah, I, I think unfortunately we're going to be getting busier. But um, yeah, if we can have your contact details. That I think this is definitely an area that we're going to need support with, or um, our clients are going to need support with. I think in time. So yeah, well, uh, it would be lovely to connect with as, as many of you as possible. So please feel free. I'll put my details in the uh, in the in the chat box. It'd be uh, yeah, great greater catch up with any of you that are interested and want to speak further but yeah I mean one of the things I've heard more recently is, is this concept of director fatigue that they've managed to get themselves through the pandemic but that they're just exhausted and, and that those that are sort of running close to the edge just don't feel like they've got the sort of mental and physical strength to, to sort of toughen it out for another year or two where things are not yet back on uh, back up and running which is a shame. And yeah just quickly Andrew what about the bounce back loan is that government back still is that part of the it is. I mean, people needn't be worried about the bounce back loan um, in terms of you know, if they were in an insolvency scenario, as long as they didn't use it to buy the car, go on holiday or, or whatever else. Um, you know, we, we, I've come across plenty of accountants and bookkeepers who are saying, I've got a client that needs to see you, but they won't and don't want to because dot, dot, yeah. dot. You know, they, they, they know they've used the money inappropriately, but other people, it, it, it's not an issue, even to the point where if you've used it for paying small amount of your salary just to be able to sort of you know pay for your food on the table that that will it might be reviewed but it's not it's not likely to cause any any major issue so that that, that is being looked at reasonably favorably right thank yeah. you very much thank you and um, we're going to move quite swiftly this morning um on to aiden from go simple tax who's going to talk about making tax digital um, I've got a link for Aidan, so I'm going to put it in the chat area. Are you there, Aidan? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. yeah. 
Do you want to share your screen as well? Uh, please, um, I'm just going to try and do it. Is that working? No. Andrew, you might stop sharing if that's all right. Shared screens. There. Are we on now? Yeah. yeah. We're on now, Aidan, yeah. I'm just going to type this um, the link. link. The chat. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, whilst we do that, do me to just take over and start? Um, yeah, please. I just read this link out. So the link I'm putting in the chat is https forward slash forward slash meet dot zoho, Z -O -H -O dot com forward slash one B R Q Q P K four F H. Over to you, Aidan. Perfect. Um, not going into much detail today. Um, it's just a brief um, on what I have already pre-planned in relation to making tax digital for income tax, which comes in from April 24. Um, but I will be interactive following the contents page on the next slide um, about whether people who have heard of it um, want to know anything more or anything relative to themselves. Um, and I can basically open up um, the webinar from then. So um, currently on the screen, you'll see that it says the 9th of June. Um, no, today is not the 9th of June. You've not missed a few weeks. That is when the webinar for Making Tech Digital is. So a few weeks for me to plan if you have any questions or want any further details on Making Tech Digital. So um, a bit about myself. Um, I have been and um, done a couple of coffee mornings now with AIB and um, IAB, so I always get that mixed up. And um, I've also done a couple of webinars. So myself, um, I work as the personal tax senior at Go Simple Tax, which is a UK-based um, tax software for individuals and partnerships. Um, I have worked with high net worth individuals and um, self-employed individuals for around about um, 10 years in all. Um, so it's a little bit outdated this screen, um, so I need to update that. But um, yeah, so 10 years worth of experience. And then Go Simple Tax, um, if you don't use it already, it is um, a UK based software, like I've said, and it allows you to submit electronically to HMRC um, using a website rather than having to use um, either paper or the HMRC portal. So um, basically, what I will be touching on on the 9th of June will be making income tax in general, um, what to expect. Um, when does it start and who is affected, along with any um, exemptions that some lucky people can have. However, it is very strict and I wouldn't um, cross your fingers that you fall within them exemptions. The pilot scheme, um, currently people can follow the pilot scheme, which is um, a soft um, version of the making tax digital regime, um, quarterly reporting, um, keeping records digitally and there's no um, fines or anything um, currently. There is a small amount of people that fall within this uh, pilot scheme such as you, UK resident only have um, a single business or a property business and you have no other source of income um, and you're completely up to date with your self-assessments and you didn't claim any of the COVID help schemes such as the um, income support scheme or the coronavirus job retention scheme. Um, so that's pretty much the pilot scheme you can join. It should have been updated last month, um, but there hasn't been any update on HMRC's website as far as I'm aware. Um, however, Mike, a colleague of mine, is currently in Leeds um, at an HMRC event where they will be discussing the pilot scheme and whether they're opening it up to further people. So. Hopefully by then I um, he would have relayed the information and I can um, update the criteria towards the soft pilot scheme. Um, so that's something to be touching on on the webinar in the 9th of June. Um, I'll be touching on the transitioning to MTD. So for anybody that currently uses cash books um, and doesn't do much digitally, then um, there'll be major changes involved for yourself um, and your clients, I'm assuming. So you'll basically have to do digital record keeping and examples of how to do that and what um, system to use or what may be beneficial for uh, people will be included along with the requirements for the making tax digital um, 
regime legislation. So the whole transition transition into MTD um, will include examples of where you may be at at the moment, um, and then going forward, what will be um, required. So it's more about me proactively telling you um, to start looking at MTD, although it's April 2024 that it comes in, it will soon fly around. And I assume that um, a lot of people will need to definitely restructure the way they work at the moment. Um, as for example, someone who um, has one business, a client who has one business and currently just submits their tech return annually, um, they will actually have an additional five submissions per year under MTD. Um, provided that they fall within the criteria. So um, where you may think you're hectic in January with um, people submitting tech returns, you're going to get um, a lot more hectic, a lot more frequently, um, provided that um, people fall within the MTD um, requirements. So it is worth planning in advance. Um, a, workload. B, potential increase in fees as I'm not too sure what um, people would charge currently, but if you're doing five times the work, then I'm assuming you'll need to increase your fees somewhat. I'm not quite saying increase it by five times as um, not a lot of people will be happy with that, but there will need to be some sort of introduction um, to your clients of what MTD is and how you're going to basically meet in the middle um, with the changes and the updates in terms of how they run their business, uh, how they keep records, and how they're going to send the information to yourselves to process potentially. Um, deadlines and payments. We'll um, talk about the deadlines for quarterly returns, um, end of period statements, and final declarations. There's three terms that are completely new and aren't currently within the self assessment self assessment system. Uh, a bit of a tongue twist for that for me. Um, so it'll basically be um, just under, understanding the basics of what a quarter submission um, is made up of, followed by an end of period statement, what that is and when it needs to be submitted to HMRC, and then what a final declaration is and um, when that needs to be submitted as well. So um, we'll be touching all those deadlines, the new deadlines, and what happens to the um, tax return following you enrolling or your client enrolling with MTD. And then we'll just touch briefly on what payments are due, um, when they're due and what may happen in the future. Um, I'm actively looking online in regards to MTD and what suggestions people are having. And there may be some new payment structures in the future, um, potentially following the quarterly submissions that may potentially be quarterly payments. Um, nothing set in stone, all hearsay, but I will touch on it um, just as, once again to prepare as a lot of people who currently struggle to embrace the changes in technology um, will definitely be struggling by April 24 if they don't action anything prior to that date. So um, that was going to be part of the webinar and then the conclusion, hopefully um, it can be directed um, to yourselves. Um, going over pretty much everything that's above and then potentially including some examples on how you personally um, can um, fight the change of MTD and basically get on top of it and hopefully make it as smooth as possible for yourselves. So that is pretty much the content of the webinar on the 9th of June. Um, I am going to open the chat and say if there is anything else that you want to know about MTD that isn't covered above, um, I will happily um, take on any comments and I will um, in, make sure I include um, anything relevant in on that webinar. So um, if you just stick it in the chat now, um, what, you, what else you want to include on that webinar and also um, just a quick question. Are you aware of MTD for income tax? Um, another thing to put in the chat, please. Um, yes or no, a little bit. Just a little brief um, summary, um, basically getting some interaction from yourselves. Um, so I know how to target the webinar. Um, I've got 
I've done a few um, MTD webinars already and the level of engagement during the webinars is quite good to be fair. There's always lots of questions and I do adapt the slides per the questions that come in. So it's more, um, if you're aware of MTD, then say so. So then if you are then attending the webinar, I can sort of gauge what um, level of expertise um, the audience um, are aware of, so to say. So um, if people can mention the chat now. How do you register for the webinar, Aidan? Um, so that is on the next slide. So ah, right, okay. we've got um, a little bit of housekeeping now just to finish off. Um, as in previous webinars, um, IAB members receive a 25% discount if they join following the link on screen, www.gosimpletax.com forward slash IAB. Um, to register for the webinar on the 9th of June, um, it is the same link that was put in the chat. In the I chat. I learned a little bit earlier. Um, I believe Leanne might have put it in the chat as well. I know that she's um, floating in the background somewhere. She also works for Go Simple Tax. Um, but yeah, if you just jot that down um, now, the link on the screen in the middle, um, then when you go on um, to that link, you will literally have a very simple registration page. On the left-hand side, gives you details of what to expect. Um, and then on the right-hand side, I think we just ask for a few minor details um, to get you enrolled for that. And I've got a question for you. Catriona yes. has asked, hi, has the issue of bookkeepers doing in-year work for clients and accountants doing the final essay accounts been resolved? Um, what was the issue in terms of that? Um, if you're talking about on the transitional, transitional year, um, then it is just basically the last tax return will be for 23, 24, and that will be done during the MTD um, introduction year, which will be from April 24. So um, is that the issue that you mean, or is there something else um, that I need to answer in a different way? And then we've got quite a lot going. Yes, they're aware. Um, we've got clients. Suzanne's even got a 72-year-old who's still working as a carpet fitter to go digital. <laughs> well done, Suzanne. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> yes, to enable basis periods. Yeah, must really love what you, uh, what they do then. If yeah, <laughs> and then and still working. <laughs> Leanne's put the link in again that I put in. Perfect. Um, but yeah, but yeah. Um, I think most on. of us know about MTD to be honest, Ed, nowadays. Yeah, 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 I would expect so. It's always worth um, asking though, as I was on um, a webinar two weeks ago. And 42% of people actually didn't know what MTD was. So right. um, I think was... our clients don't. We do, yeah. but our clients don't. And Catriona, just going back to the last question, said, no, I understood that there couldn't be two accounts for MTD. Um, two accounts in terms of what? Catriona, have you emailed me um, separate to this? And um, we can um, combat what your um asking there um my email is on screen at the bottom aiden.corcoran at gosimpletax.co.uk and um i can basically um, have this conversation with you uh, via email if that's okay and on that i'd like to say thank you very much aiden because i'm going to swiftly move on to grant um, yeah. who's from our compliance team so thank you aiden very informative well, thank, you, thank you um are you there grant can't see anybody. I did see Grant. Um, and just while we're uh, moving on to the compliance team as well, um, we have a new um, member of the compliance team, Jackie. She's on the call, I think, this morning. So I'd just like to welcome her to the team formally. So I'm sure some of you will be hearing from her in the future as well. Um, and uh, Grant is back from holiday. So I'm sure he's had a fabulous time. <laughs> Is he, is he I back? Am, I am here, yes. Oh, yeah. you are there. I did, okay. I did have a good time. I didn't get back till the early hours of yesterday morning, so I'm still recovering a little bit from the six hours difference. Oh, but wow. I'm not going to dwell on the, the fabulous time I've just had. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice to know. You look very well anyway, Grant. Smashing, thank you. Um, yes, Grant Gibson, I'm the Deputy Manager for Compliance and Professional Standards at the IAB. Um, 
look at looking around at uh, names and faces. Well, I don't know any faces, quite frankly, but I know <laughs> lots of names um, that cross my desk. Um, a lot, a lot of you have actually done the hard work for uh, inspections, um, and I think the ma the main thing is to uh, to just stress is that now you've done that hard work is to maintain it and keep on top of it. And what I really wanted to discuss this morning, hopefully um, briefly uh, and not too in depth, is what we left off from uh, the last coffee morning. So in the April contribution, I gave you an overview of the compliance team's skills and qualities. Um, and I hope that we were able to demonstrate the role and function of the compliance and professional standards officer in that we are responsible for ensuring the organization and its members comply with both internal and external regulatory requirements. That we take our role seriously and personally to achieve high standards on this learning journey. And that's something that we really want to sort of emphasize is that for you and for us, it is a learning journey. Not only are we engaged in the enforcement, but we have a responsibility to engage with support and guidance with your learning journey. So for you as members, this engagement will be through your AML inspection, follow-up and action plans, reviews and surveys, and the survey that we, you will have conducted last month um, titled Sanctions. And I think the response to that was uh, around about 80 to 85%, which was really very good. Um, we conducted our last session by looking at uh, or ending on anxiety and how anxiety is created by notice of an AML inspection. Um, and just briefly, the, the aims and objectives of today are dealing with anxiety created by the inspection, the inspection and the outcome. So anxiety itself, and I'm not going to go into any medical way or any particular way of dealing with it, but it's that feeling of unease, worry and fear. We've all felt anxious at any times, be it an exam, a test or something that may be going on in our personal lives. But it's how we approach and tackle uh, that situation that can ease or escalate those effects. And taking experience and knowledge from others is one way of actually um, dealing with those effects, helping us overcome the effects. And another would be to review and reflect on our own personal or past experiences. But taking the opportunity now to plan and prepare if you have not had your inspection. Um, and just one example that I may actually give is that as, as a chair of governors some years ago of our secondary school, um, Ofsted came into inspectors and I was actually called in as an individual to be uh, questioned for 45 minutes. And I literally felt like a rabbit in headlights as a group and panel of inspectors grilled me about my knowledge and understanding of the school. And uh, it really was quite intimidating. I reflected on what had actually gone on during that particular time and decided that if it ever came round again, which unfortunately it did come round again about three years later, then what would I do to try and ease that particular experience? And I decided that I wasn't going to go in alone. I was going to take at least three, if not four, of my senior governors and we would reverse the tables and that's what we actually did the Ofsted inspector who inspected us on that occasion said that she had never been particularly um, impressed or as intimidated and as, as we actually were to her, um, but gave her the information, knowledge and confidence um, and understanding of the school that we actually had. So it was something to, to actually reflect on. Um, that we actually turn the tables on such a, such a situation. So those of you that have not yet been inspected, don't sit around, don't wait for that call. If you feel that you're not quite on top of your domestic affairs, then now's the time to dust off those policy and procedures, check out your reviews and prepare. Look at the IAB website and start to gain and feel what is available. That April newsletter that uh, Sam posted out to you is a fabulous link and guide to outlining access to improving your policy and procedures. 
So what is the inspection? Very briefly, um, carefully read the accompanying letter that will come out to you and create a timeline of events and tick them off as they pass you by. Arrange your virtual appointment as early as possible because that way you can get the time that suits you, it suits your business, it suits your workload, your current commitments, and whatever appointments, be it business or personal, you may actually have. It's no secret what the inspection is looking at because all the information is on the website. Just go and have a look at it. Um, the headings are quite clearly identified. Even the letter that we'll send out has links, but what we do find is people don't read the letter. Don't read it once, don't skim read it, read it at least two or three times. So you actually familiarize yourself with what the process is going to be. You take charge of it, take control of it. If the policy and procedure was still a hard copy booklet rather than it being electronic, then I would expect it and I tell, and some of you sat there have probably sort of heard this before, that document would be the most dog-eared, thumbed and well-used book on the bookshelf as your staff are regularly using it, regularly updating it and regularly referring to it. If you haven't had your AML inspection, you've not been inspected yet, do your preparation and do it now. So what are the big issues? What are the issues that we're actually finding? Um, making your policy and procedure bespoke to your business and your business needs. That is something that really comes out very often. Those of you that are ambassadors and ambassador leaders, this is something that you can pass on to your groups. A policy, quite simply, a policy is a course or principle of action adopted by your organization, by your business. The procedure is an established or official way of doing something. Those are the very simple, quite in a nutshell, means and ways of a policy and your procedure. Other issues that we find are quite simply verifying, signing and retaining the documents through CDD. Individual client risk mitigation, what are they? What's the detail? Uh, we recommend a continuity plan for your premises, systems and people. This doesn't need to be a big long document, at school, we have a 45 page document. You don't need that. Something such as uh, the side of an A4, maybe even extending to um, two sides of A4 is quite sufficient. Registering with the NCA's SAR online and creating your internal and external procedures. And people do say, well, I'm only a one man band. Why do I need that? Quite simply, I liken these these issues to when I used to stand up in court and being quizzed by some smart barrister or in some cases a number of smart barristers who would often come back and say well officer very eloquently put but do you have any evidence to prove it well yes I have it's either here in my pocket notebook or it's over there in all that evidence that I've actually brought with me After you've had your, uh, your inspection, you'll receive a report and an action plan. Don't be put off by it. This is your learning journey. Read through it carefully. However, don't respond after 42 minutes by stating that, you've, that I have made several errors, the inspectors have made several errors, because you will receive a very polite yet forensic response, and you will see that we haven't made any errors, and it will be a courteous point in the right direction. Establish what your deadline date is. Don't try and tackle all the actions in one go. I'll stick my teacher head back on, break it down into bite-sized chunks. I don't like mnemonics, but there are only two mnemonics that I use. One of them is KISS, keep it simple. The other one is SMART, be specific, be measurable, make it achievable, be realistic and keep it timely. If you have a number of actions, if you try and tackle them all at once, you'll start and get muddled up going back to each one and then tying yourself in knots. Do two or three of them in one day or in one session 
and then walk away from them and come back to them at a later stage or move on to the next ones. You've got plenty of time to do them. The very minimum time is 30 days, but we've got 45 and 60 days in most cases. And some of you out there may have only had one or two. And yes, I will ring you up and I will say, can you get this done over the weekend? Can you get it done in a few days? Because if it's fresh in your mind, then you can get it done, get it out of the way and carry on with your business as usual. Review your work. Again, I always ask my students to read their work before they submit it. Yeah, but Grant, that's going to take some time. I know it'll take a time. Not a lot of time, only a few minutes, but it saved me no end of corrections and they learn so much more about themselves and what they've actually written because they pick out their own mistakes and their own errors. Above all, if you're unsure, ask. Ask us for help. Email us, ring in the office. Um, it's a learning journey. That's what you're there for. That's what we're here for, as well as a formal inspection. And that's all I've got to say today. Thank you. And I've got a question for you, Grant. Could, Cheryl said, could we select it for an inspection in consecutive years? So if I was inspected yesterday, what's the likelihood of me being inspected again next year? Uh, pretty unlikely. We're not doing it every, sing every single year. And there will be, when you've had a full um, inspection, the type of inspection we'll get next time, we'll be looking at different areas or a specific area. So is it possible that in the follow-up inspection, you'd only be kind of looking at things where you'd you'd sent me um, where you'd found fault? Where well, you may have had a weakness. Time. It would yeah. be, yeah. A weakness rather than a, yeah. Thank you. Selena says, I was very anxious before my inspection last year, but the inspectors who undertook my inspection and follow-up totally put me at ease. Very professional and empathic. Empathetic. Em yeah. Empathetic. I don't know. I can't say it. Empathetic. That's the word. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, and I'd just also just like to share some um, statistics which we've got coming out now about the use of IB Blue. So as you all know, we've got an eight module IB Blue um, course, if you like, on the IB shop on the website. So we've now got statistics coming through that those that have completed those courses at least 70 days, it doesn't have to be 70 days, but in advance of 70 days before your inspection, um, then your, the outcome of your inspection is significantly better. So the point is, it's like if you rush and cram, you're not going to get the same results. And if you plan and maintain that, so it, it's an important part of your business. Um, so just saying we've got all those, that support there around you as well. Um, the other thing I'd just like to touch on as well, because I know we had lots of questions about this, was just an update on IB Connect. So um, for those of you who don't, don't know, we've got um, a software in development um, called IB Connect, and that will replace AMLCC. It will be your own bespoke area where you can um, complete your firm risk assessment and record all your, um, all, all your practice clients as well, and that will risk rate them. Uh, we were hoping to have that out earlier on this year, but obviously it's a complex project and software developers don't work the timeline that we would hope that they would. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to be really, really clear that um, AM, AMLCC, which was um, the software we, we used to collaborate with, we are no longer in partnership with. You're totally entitled to carry on using that, but it is at your own cost. We don't recommend that now. Um, but in the meantime, between being in that situation and IB Connect coming online, we do have some bridging options. So if you do get in touch with the membership team, they will support you through that process as well. But all the documents are, are on the website and will be part will be sent out to you as part of your renewal process as well. So I just thought it was fair to update you, but we are expecting that to be online later on in the year. And but I'm not going to put a time to it. <laughs> it's not just us that are in control of that um, deadline. Karen has said, in my opinion, IAB Blue Module 1 and 8 are much better than the AMLLC training courses. Found them to be in a much more understandable format and more specific than the AMLCC ones. Yeah, we are getting some really positive feedback uh, and some really good results from them. So, But our amazing Rob was quite involved in writing those. So, 
Yeah. Um, yeah, from a good source. And um, just following on from what Grant said about reading everything, can I just say that the emails that we get from the IAB in relation to the current sanctions in Russia, um, if we can all make sure that we are reading them, because um, there is a lot of information in them at the moment. And we do need that information. Yeah, please, please do look out for them. Don't ignore. And on that basis, can I just give everyone a reminder as well, just to make sure that you are getting our emails coming out. So predominantly the emails will be coming out to you from hello at IAB and membership at IAB. So if you can make sure that they are marked in your inbox as um, regular contacts, I can't, I don't know what the term is in each individual, but just so it doesn't go to junk or make sure that you mark them as, you know, they're the contact that you want to receive from because it is important communication that we're sending out and we don't want you to miss it so um please just just check your settings on your computer too and susan's asked um without naming names has anyone achieved exceptional yet on their aml inspection sarah grant anybody are you allowed to share <laughs> um, <laughs> the honest answer is no uh, however um we we, we the, the the term really is not exceptional it's outstanding um over the overall grade um has not been achieved as um in in the eight areas as outstanding however some people yeah, uh, have achieved that. outstanding in some of the eight areas with obviously good in the in the other areas Yes, we've so had some very, very people, close. So there are people out there who, who have achieved it. So. Something to aim for then. Anybody who hasn't been inspected yet? However, <laughs> as a as a former teacher, I always look at why have they got outstanding? And you've <laughs> you've really got to you've really got to sort of make the mark. Yeah. So um good. It'll be interesting when somebody finally gets it. I think. I think we might need to have a little celebration. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, have you anything else, Sarah? Um, no. The only other thing which I do have, which is I suppose a minor point now, um, often I, I get notifications from HMRC about changes in legislation, as you all know. Um, there was um, a, we we had uh, there was a change on the sixth of May. Actually, what HMRC have published is a change to um, accessing our clients, um, the rules around accessing clients' details through their portal. And um, what they're what they're saying is, can us as bookkeepers and accountants not use our clients' login to um, their HMRC portal or to use our agent one? Now they haven't updated their conduct so it's still not um punishable if you like but that's clearly the direction of travel and there has been now social media started this week about it so just a heads up really as to be getting all your clients uh, or get them on your agent codes rather than accessing directly there's obviously a change in feeling around that but that's the only um updated to legislation i can share at the moment thank you very much um in the chat very helpful information. Thank you, Grant. Um, what percentage have to have a reinspection, Grant? Do we know? Have reinspection started yet? Are we talking about reinspections or just uh, an inspection on uh, action plan? It says a reinspection. Okay. Um, um, I think that's a follow up inspection, isn't it? Rather than. Is that what you mean? I think action so. Action plan, Cheryl said, yeah. So yeah. an, an action plan that comes as a result of the uh, of the inspection. So it's it is a follow up. Yes. We we follow up the um, the inspection with any action plans, um, which are then com completed and conclude the the AML inspection. Thank you. Hopefully Brilliant. that that clears that up. Right, I think we're running out of time. I'd just like to say thank you to all our speakers today. Are. Really informative. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much, everybody. And at that, I'm going to say goodbye. Yeah. Good to, to see everybody. everybody. And then, oh, next meeting. Sorry, next coffee morning, Wednesday, the 15th of June. Hopefully, we'll see you all then. Brilliant. Bye. Bye. Look forward Bye. to that. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.